Welcome to the History Nerds United podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Today we have author Maureen Ryan. You can call her Mo. I certainly did. And her book, Burn It Down. You have heard about Burn It Down. I'm promising you. You may not have heard the book title, but in the past week since it's come out, it's hit number one on a bunch of lists. It's already a bestseller. And if you're already starting to see articles about how on the TV show Lost, there was a whole bunch of problems, Sleepy Hollow, all of these things coming out of the woodwork, it's actually not out of the woodwork. It's actually out of Moe's book. I was so happy to talk to her. She's an amazing person. And just a side note, I know I seem to say that every episode, because it's true. I've yet to meet an author that wasn't awesome. However, Mo and I had a special bond, and you're going to hear why. There are some TV shows that you probably never heard of, and we both love them. We get off on tangents here and there. It's wonderful, but the book is amazing. It's doing gangbusters. Mo and I got along so well, she already agreed to do a second episode with us, which now that I've put that out into the world, she's going to have to follow through. It was a little trap I set for her. It's fine. Anyway, this is so much fun. I want you to hear it, so I'm going to shut up. Mo Ryan, let's talk to her. And here we are with author Maureen Ryan, Burn It Down, Power, Complicity, and a Call for Change in Hollywood. Mo, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I have to say, you picked the perfect release date. There's nothing much going on in Hollywood, so you can focus entirely on this. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, it's it's a slow time. It's a slow news period for Hollywood. Nothing. I mean, everyone's getting along great. And feeling good about the future of the industry. So good time to drop this book. Yes, 100%. (laughs) Now, we're recording in late May. I want to see if you can be Nostradamus on this one. We're recording in late May. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're going to put this up in a couple weeks. Is this strike still going to be going in a couple weeks? What's what's your guess on this? My guess is yes. Uh, In part because there are just some sort of technicalities that exist. Like currently the AMPTP, I always think I'm going to say that wrong, but the, the, basically the, the umbrella group that negotiates with the different guilds, negotiations with the Writers Guild ended and the Writers Guild of America went out on strike. And at the current moment that we're recording, I think probably into early June, perhaps, I'm not 100% sure of the dates, but around now they are in formal talks with the Directors Guild of America. And so they don't do, I think, more than one guild at a time. Uh, And actually later in June, there will be talks with the Screen Actors Guild, SAG-AFTRA. So they're going to kind of do this merry-go-round. So I think realistically, if they were to go back to the table with the Writers Guild of America, that wouldn't happen for a few weeks, just because you know, it's kind of like these things are queued up in a certain way. So I think when my book comes out, the writers, I'm 99% certain, will still be on the picket line. And possibly a few weeks after that, they might be joined by some other folks. All right, another fresh topic. And listen, I'm poking at a new wound. All right, I apologize. Please don't hang up on me. But today it was announced that HBO's new streaming service is called Max. How angry are you that they did not take your suggestion and call it Mo? I want you to be honest, like scale of one to 10, how pissed off are you? It was right there. It was right there. I mean, how hard is this? It's like HBO with that cool stylized O in their most recent logo. And then Max, the nice you know, lowercase m. I, I actually even gave it to, on Twitter. I put a, a mo like and with my incredible graphic design skills. I don't know if you saw it, but yeah, it's it's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty pointed attack on me personally, I think. And uh, I will be consulting my attorneys. No, I'm kidding. I gotta say, in a more serious vein, though, I don't understand why you would take Max as being the primary term there. And, you know, HBO is one of the most storied and legendary brands in all of media or entertainment. And why you would dump that part of it is something I will never understand. But if we get onto the topic of things that happen in the entertainment industry that I will never and have never understood, (laughs) we would be here for many hours. Well, I'm finally with somebody I think that will understand why I'm confused. Does nobody else remember Cinemax? I'm still getting confused with Cinemax. When I first saw it, I'm like, Max, like, is it Cinemax? They don't have anything. Has that been around? 
As much as back in the day, we would call it Skinamax, and you know, I don't know what you mean. I have no idea. I, what you're I know about. no con- no one knows what I mean, of course. But actually, Skinamax got into doing originals. They had a series by Steven Soderbergh called The Nick that was amazing. They had a wonderful show called Banshee. They had a really really great show called Warrior, which has finally come back on Max this summer uh, for its third season. They had a number of shows that were really good. And the funny thing about the HBO Max rollout is that I believe none of the Cinemax shows, the quality Cinemax content was there. And I was like, huh, what? And then now they're calling the whole Endeavor Max. I'm like, it doesn't make sense. I don't know. It's not how I would have gone about it. Maybe it's not how you would have gone about it, but there that's true of so many things that occur that I guess. <laughs> I couldn't. I mean, listen, we need to give them a break because they've been batting a thousand right before this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Moving on, I want to ask you a question that I think actually might get you in trouble. But I, I cooked this one up in my head before we got on. Let's do it. Hypothetical. If you were told you are only allowed to have one streaming service, which one would you pick right now? Oh, my God. You're really you're just coming in hot mm-hmm. with the hardest question. Wow, 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 wow. And now I thought of it. I'll help you out a little bit here because I thought about it. Okay. My answer right now would be Hulu. That is a real solid choice. Yeah. Hulu because these are the three that really get it for me. Single Drunk Female, one of my favorite new shows. Mm -hmm. The Bear Mm -hmm. and The Coup de Gras, The Great. Mm -hmm. I mean, on those three alone, when I really thought about it, I said, that's what it is. It has to be Hulu. Yep. Reservation Dogs, Mm -hmm. Abbott Elementary. Um, There's a lot of really good library content. Another one I'll make a shout out for is Criterion Collection, which is, I'm, I love old movies. And this is something that it, it's more of like a feature that I'm more into these days. Criterion and HBO Max, which I'm still going to call it, even though it's now called Max, because I, my brain cannot accept this information. They both have a tab called like Leaving Soon or Before It's Gone. And I love to just troll through that tab. So lately, I've been catching up on movies. In some cases, I just realized I had not not seen the Tom Cruise version of The Firm from 30 years ago. Really? <laughs> like, or maybe I saw it and I forgot the whole thing. It's possible. It's certainly possible. So I lately, I, what I've been doing is going to the Before It's Gone tab of the few services that have that and just poking around and being like, you know, I have been meaning to watch that for a million years. So I'm going to watch it's led to some very strange selections. Like, I believe it was, it just left HBO Max, but uh, the Day the Earth Stood Still, the 2008 version. Uh, the title of that film feels like a summary of how it felt to watch it. Um, it was it was not good. I, I love Keanu, but uh, yeah. I think Hulu is a solid choice. And weirdly enough, Paramount, especially if you have the Showtime edition, has a pretty decent film library and also has all the Star Trek stuff. And if you, again, if you have the Showtime, it has, you know, Yellow Jackets and all the Showtime shows. It's a tough one. Now, this was all a trap because before we <laughs> get into Burn It Down, where you talk about a lot of the problems going around, I wanted to get that nerd out of you about how much you actually yeah. love all this Hollywood stuff. I do. Before we really dive in, and this is in the book, and I did a little research and found out uh, something else, too. I just feel like we should be best friends merely based on the fact that you and I are both huge fans of two of the most underrated shows of all time, Killjoys and Spartacus. And this is why this is, you know, in the running to be my favorite interview. I'll have to I'll have to go over the, the whole press cycle. But those are two great shows that people, more people should know about. And we're so good. And I honestly think I wish Killjoy was streaming. I have bought the seasons, you know, on one of the platforms. I have bought it. So like, to me, it's worth the investment. Yeah. And Spartacus, I think they're redeveloping, you know, a sort of companion series. And it's Stephen DeKnight who did the original. So I'm very excited about that. I did not know this. Yeah. Obviously, with the strike, who can say what will emerge out of the strike pipeline, so to speak, when the strike ends? Uh, but yeah, uh, sometime within the last six months or so, it was announced that Stephen would be developing a new dramatic series to be like a companion. Not a lot of details were announced, but I mean, for me, honestly, the main thing is that he is leading it once again creatively, because that was a show that when TV does something well, I think what it allows is for many, many artisans and actors and artists and creative people to collaborate, of course. But I think from Jump, Stephen had something to say, and he was allowed to kind of 
say it. And one of the things I loved about it was that you could look at that show and simply see the trappings of a sword and sandals epics with a lot of beheadings and a lot of sex, which it had. And it was gleefully embracing those things all the time. And I love that. But there was also a lot of other layers to that show, a lot of political subversiveness that I really appreciated it. And that's one of my favorite things in television when over time you realize, oh, okay, so, you know, like House, it's a doctor's show. What House really was, especially in its early seasons, was an ethics seminar. You know, if you had a really interesting professor talking to you about ethical dilemma and philosophical problems and the human condition, this is what you would be talking about. But they put it, they very smartly put it in this format of a TV show about a cranky doctor, which is, you know, the TV executives would be like, yes, give us a procedural about a cranky doctor. Um, But they they smuggled in a lot of shows. Oh, I'm sorry. They smuggled in a lot about a a lot of themes and ideas uh, that I just thought were super interesting and, and, and Spartacus definitely did that. And same with Killjoys, really. I think I think the theme between Killjoys and, and uh, Spartacus is that I like to see people kicking ass intergalactically or gladiatorially and, you know, having adventures and also maybe, you know, having a revolution or two just for funsies. Spartacus also sneaks in history. Yeah. There's a shocking amount of it. Now, we don't know a lot about Spartacus, but, uh, you know, I've read books on actual Spartacus, and there's a lot of historical beats that they stick to. And especially I've been reading with Succession wrapping up soon, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel wrapping up soon. Spartacus is one of the best series finales of all time. I will not hear an argument about it. It was, damn it, it was perfect. It was so good. And believe you me, I've watched a lot of finales where it was like, like, okay, is like, I think really a, a core principle that I arrived at as a critic was that if you were to list the top 10 episodes of any TV series, the pilot and the series finale are almost never going to be in that top 10. There is just so much that they have to do that it's almost, it's very, very difficult to make a good series finale. To make a great one is like completely next level. I mean, I think The Shield did it. I do think Killjoys did it. I think Spartacus did it. There's, there's many examples of people actually nailing it. I just did a rewatch of Battlestar Galactica and I'm like, you know, That two-hour finale, I remember watching it in the theater. They brought the press out to New York to, like, come and watch it. And there were so many moments I actually remember sitting there in my seat and just being, like, like a a fan, total fangirl that I am. So it's a hard thing to do. It's really hard. And so I think I'm a little easier on when shows kind of maybe fumble an element of it. When they fumble the whole thing, then that's a different conversation, but... Well, I mean, what I love about Spartacus, and this goes back to Steve Nesta Knight, he did something that no show trusts its audience. The big bad for the final season of Spartacus was not a bad guy. I watched it, and I'm like, this is a good guy who's just on the other side mm-hmm. of Spartacus. He's not evil. He's not doing awful things. He's doing his job, and he's doing what's right as a leader from his perspective. Right. And I think there's so many shows that just don't trust the audience to sit there and say, there can be two sides to this. And you can kind of root for them both, even though we all know who we really want to win. And I mean, that's what really put it over for me. I agree. Yeah. I think creating credible oppositional forces that are also interesting in their own right. I mean, I think on the movies front, there are not that many good villains anymore. You know, I mean, I think Black Panther was, you know, the first Black Panther film was one of the classic cases of this is just a guy who believes some different things. And I don't know that he's wrong about those things. Not all of them anyway. So when you have a really good oppositional force that is well-developed and depicted, that that's the goal for me. So now that we've talked about how all the stuff that we love about Hollywood, yes, let's drag it through the mud just a little bit. I don't want to say that too hard, right? Because Burn It Down, there was a few things that I was worried about when I first reading it, right? Anything that's, you know, a bit too contemporary, there's, you know, kind of sometimes a problem with perspective. A lot of people take one side or the other and just kind of go to extremes. If you don't believe me, just go on Twitter for five minutes, you'll see it. <laughs> But as I'm reading this, I'm like, holy cow, this was reasonable and realistic. That's what kind of kept popping in my head, which is this is this massive system that's been put in and certain things have worked and certain things have made people money. And 
things need to change, but you also can't expect to snap your fingers and everything's going to change and be perfect the next day. Was that something that was really important to you as you were writing to kind of find that middle ground? Or were you kind of like, ooh, I don't know how this will turn out? Well, I mean, I'm so glad that you said the words reasonable and realistic because, you know, the title is is like quite literally incendiary. You know, some of the stuff makes me angry and I think righteously angry and I think understandably angry. But to me, it's OK to be angry, but I wanted to do more than that. You know, I wanted it to be a book that I don't have all the answers. I don't have every solution to every problem, but I do think here are some reframings of how we can think about this, or here are some solutions that uh, veterans of this industry have implemented and have worked, or, oh, this didn't work, don't do that. When I was pitching the book around, what I said to everybody was, I don't want this to just be a series of dispiriting situations, or only, you know, there are parts where I'm, I offer my opinion in a stringent and succinct fashion, <laughs> which is, I guess, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not holding back, put it that way. But to me, the book wouldn't have worked if someone left, put it down and thought Mo Ryan dislikes Hollywood and all and, and doesn't think it can be redeemed, even if, it, you know, it, it's not worth the effort to try to redeem what doesn't work or to try to fix what doesn't work. I don't believe that. My pitch was, yeah, I'm going to offer up some specific situations where I have reporting that confirms or expands on information about difficult or bad situations. There's no doubt that that needs to be in the book as sort of object lessons of what I'm trying to get at. Why are these things so deep-seated? What are examples of how deep-seated and difficult to eradicate this or that problem is? I wanted that to be in there. But I told everybody the last third of the book will be suggestions and ideas for reform. And I, I want to leave people in a place where they think that this can be done. It's difficult. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's it's very difficult. And the, the days that I have that are difficult are the days where I'm like, was I wrong about that whole <laughs> fixable thing? Am I, am I insane? The fact of the matter is that since I began covering the industry in the 90s, some things have changed for the better. I needed to write a book because the complexity of the addendums to that statement are the following. Things have changed, but they changed from a very toxic and skewed set of norms. I personally don't believe on many fronts they have changed enough. And the reality is that some things have gotten worse. In terms of establishing a career in the industry, that was always hard. Sustaining a livable income and the ability to do what you love and what you're good at over time while being able to pay your bills and have somewhere to live and not be wrecked by medical bills and, you know, just have a normal life. I think that's actually gotten harder in the last, especially some things accelerated in the last five to 10 years. That is just, it's, they, those trends have made things very difficult for people trying to earn a living. So the reason to write a book instead of, oh, here's an opinion piece or Vanity Fair or whatever is because it's complicated. And to be honest about that complexity and the difficulty of the challenges ahead, you know, that would be kind of insulting to the people in the industry and the people who care about what the industry makes. Because this is not just a book for people on the inside of the industry. I hoped and I tried very hard to make it accessible to people who just care about what they watch, where it comes from, who makes it, the conditions under which it's made. And I think a lot of people who consume movies and TV care about the issues raised by various reckonings. You know, me too. There have been racial reckonings. There have been reckonings on homophobia and, and issues of that kind. And so I think a lot of consumers of entertainment care about those, those things and want to know, like, realistically, what is happening and how could it be changed. And so I'm hopefully aiming it at them, too. What I really appreciate about the book, and you mentioned this, there's, it's basically almost two books, right? Your first two thirds is digging into actual examples. I mean, you've written almost a business book that's better than a business book because it's not just, hey, do this because this will be 10% better. Shut up. I'm smarter than you. <laughs> your first two thirds, listen, there's some Hollywood drama in there. Everybody wants the dirt. It's in there. But that first two thirds when you dig in, I really appreciate that you're talking about everyone in Hollywood, right? It's not just about there have been actors and actresses who have been treated horribly, but a lot of people forget about just the intern or pages or grips. I don't know what any of those things mean, but I'm pretty sure that those are people in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned like 
they can't pay to live in Hollywood. Like, how are people supposed to do this? You really wanted to get the full spectrum and kind of not leave anyone out, right? Absolutely. I'm so glad that that resonated for you because obviously Hollywood is the dream factory. You know, people are invested in this idea. And I consider myself as part of that group of people. Oh, it's glamorous. It's cool. It's fun. You know, you're going to make a lot of money. The fact is the vast majority of people don't work 52 weeks of the year in the industry. Even the A-listers, you know, they're going from project to project. And of course, at a certain point, if you're in the very, very highest tiers as an executive, as a creative person, as an actor, you know, you have the cool house that's in architectural digest and you have the cool life. But even those people, your career can be over. I mean, how many times have you sat there and watched, you know, a movie from 20 years and go, what happened to that actor? They're still good. I would assume they're still like doing their thing. But the, it can be a very fickle industry and very few people have the kind of money that allows them to be set up for life. The majority of people, the vast majority of people in every single job category, they are just trying to pay their bills. And one line that I wanted to, I, I wanted to create a connection between, you know, someone who was working in a big box store or an Amazon warehouse or Office Max or Target, they are dealing with the same forces that a grip or an assistant or a story editor is dealing with at their workplace, you know, issues, sure, issues of management and conduct and toxicity can prevail at any workplace. But the economic forces that are driving people's incomes down, I don't think the average key grip on the set of an Amazon TV show and the average Amazon warehouse worker, I don't think there's a, a gulf separating those two people. I do think that their jobs can be precarious and it can be difficult to make ends meet in these gigs for the most part. And, you know, the, the Writers Guild strike, they've offered up statistics. And I'm, I'm a big believer in stats and, and research and respected outlets putting out res research. And Hollywood actually has, there's tons of stats. There's tons of reports that come out every year. Um, and the Writers Guild has backed up their stats with press releases. They've given us a lot of information. And by many measures, while the amount of TV, scripted TV shows in, in America tripled in the last decade, the income of the average writer went down. So I think what you had was a situation where more people got jobs, but everybody's incomes went down. And during that time frame, these companies did well. And it could have been a case where a rising tide lifts all boats, but that's not what happened. The most amazing section of this book, just as an example, because you have a lot of things like this, Damon Lindelof of Lost Fame. Right. You kind of dig into and and tell me, I, I don't know that you say this directly, but it seems like he was very open, very friendly with you, that he was somebody that you kind of go to for a quote. And then you start doing this research and you go, oh, wait a second, there's some problems here and they can kind of go back to him. In the book, you go back to him. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to ask, first of all, as somebody who may have been, you know, professionally friendly with him. What are your feelings going back to somebody like that who has been, you know, apparently very open about things and just say, hey, this is screwed up and it comes back to you? <laughs> was that tough or was that just that's part of the job? You got to do it. It's it's always tough. I mean, I don't know if you saw, but in 2021, I talked to Jeff Garland. I was going to ask you to compare and contrast what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the last few years, there have been some conversations that were, were challenging, you know, with a number of people and the conversations with Damon. They were hard, but it's interesting. You know, the first thing I do before I go back to someone like that, and I've done this many times in my career, is be as solid, you know, about my information as I can be. Do really diligent reporting. And for this book and for my work in general, I go back to people again and again. And I think, I hope sometimes they don't get sick of me, but I try to have as much context, nuance, depth, to the information that I have so that when I do have a difficult interview like that, I have what I need to have that conversation. Yeah, it, it was difficult. You know, it, I, I can't lie. It's There were certain chapters in the book that were really hard to do because I wasn't, and it's not, the conversations with the people who suffered at Lost, those were, you know, if anything, more difficult. And I take my hat off to the people who are willing to be honest and willing to share their truths, which, you know, a lot of them, that was a defining moment in their career and they are proud of their work, but they have been 
sitting on information that it was really hard to kind of keep under their hat. And I understand why now. I do understand why. I think there are a few instances in the book, and the last chapter is one of them, where I frankly hope I'm just opening the door for people to share their truths honestly. I don't know if the conversation about lost you know, is over after my book comes out. What I do feel is that as one of the people who was kind of there for that rocket ship ride and covered the show a lot, I feel like just for myself, I understand why my generation of critics often went to the showrunner as the architect of whatever we were watching and getting into and digging. And I, you know, I interviewed Stephen tonight many times for Spartacus. I've interviewed many showrunners from the biggest HBO shows to, you know, the most cult series of all time. When I was coming up, it was more like, oh, here are the actors and here are their glamorous lives. And and then the generation of critics rose up and we still like talking to actors and musicians and artists and artisans. But to talk to the showrunner, like that was getting the real juice. Like that was, these people know the whole game plan. This is so cool. Uh, it's like you're not just talking to the pitcher, you're talking to the coach who has the whole season mapped out in his head, you know. So I get why we did that, but I so we made that transition to talk about the showrunner or, you know, the top person of the creative endeavor, the director of a big tentpole movie or what have you. But I don't think, speaking for myself, I wish I had thought more about what it was like to work for those people. And in some cases, it was great. You know, in some cases, it was delightful to work for some people, but I was part of a system that kind of put people on pedestals and made the inference that if a screen story was wonderful, then that person probably was wonderful too. And, you know, in a way, isn't there something hopeful about that theory? (laughs) That if a story on screen moved us or we connected with it, I think the tendency in human nature to want to give the benefit of the doubt to the people who made that thing, especially to the people who are most responsible for that thing, I don't regret being a human being, and I think it's a human thing to do that, to sort of make that assumption that if the work is incredible, then the people that made it were probably incredible and kind and good and generous. And But now that I know what I know about the industry, to be a really good artist, you have to be in your head, you have to sketch it out, you have to really like kind of live in your dream world. And then when you're on a set or you're in the production offices or the edit bays or the writer's room, you have to do all that stuff in concert with other people. And I don't think that that's a natural skill that people are born with. And you have to learn it. And for a long time, there was something of an apprenticeship system in TV, especially of like, you would go up the ranks of the writing and producing staffs, and you would then get to be a showrunner and get to run stuff. But really, what a lot of people took on board was the idea, well, I was treated in an abusive manner so that when I become the boss, I'm allowed to, if I want to, treat people in an inappropriate, unprofessional or abusive way, which is not the lesson we wanted people to learn. The beatings will continue until morale improves. Right? That was really the philosophy of Hollywood for a long time. So the complicity in the title of my book, I didn't know what I didn't know then. I'm not saying I should have been clairvoyant. But there is some complicity in who I built up and who I didn't even think about asking questions to. So I consider myself as part of that. And I don't consider myself above it or, you know, apart from it. And so things like the Sleepy Hollow chapter, the Lost chapter, Saturday Night Live chapter, those were hard to write. But I hope in a way that's not overbearing, I talk about what I wish I'd done differently at different times or what happened then and how. You know, with Lost, I didn't, I honestly didn't know what I didn't know for the longest time. And then I learned more. And there were a few stories I wanted to get out there. And Sleepy Hollow was another one where I was like, to do, no magazine's going to let me write 16,000 words on this. So I think I have to collect a number of these things and put them together in a book, hopefully structured in a way that uses these things as case studies so that we can talk about going beyond that particular show or set to what does that say about the industry then and how much of that is still happening now. And I mean, to be hopeful about it, uh, you don't have to say this part. I'll say it. You talk to Jeff Garland. Jeff Garland's never going to get it. Just if you if you read his response to all of that stuff, he's never going to get it. With Damon Lindelof, and I don't want to give him too much credit, right, because he oversaw this kind of toxic environment. 
But your chapter on him, it's hopeful in a way because he honestly seemed crestfallen when you brought this all to him. And, you know, there was some defensiveness, but it also seemed like a light went on and he did not like what he saw, but still at least a light went on, which is kind of what you're trying to do with the book, right? Is it's, you don't have to change tomorrow, but turn the lights on and start looking around and saying, oh, are you really doing a good job right now or could you be doing a lot better? Right. That's always the goal is what can we illuminate? And, you know, frankly, in some cases, actions matter more than words. In a lot of cases, I think, you know, I think we are, you know, Hollywood is a place of wordsmiths and story spinners. And I love that for the screen and for the page. But I think sometimes there's story spinning that goes on about what people did or didn't do and what they could or could not have prevented. And words are fine up to a point, but the people who, and, and, and this is across my entire career, especially the last six years of doing a lot of difficult reporting, the people who went forward and said and read that story or were part of that story or were the focus of that story or book or whatever, the people who go forward and do the absolute level best that they can do to make the industry better with a series of concrete actions and putting skin in the game to make the industry better, that's really the name of the game for me. I really hope that people take the example from people who, some people who worked at Lost or worked at other difficult workplaces, they're in the book as voices who went forward and did things differently. And that was a conscious choice on their part. There's nothing in the world that says that if you had a difficult boss or someone who was difficult or abusive, that you have to go on and replicate that. I don't think that that's a thing that anyone that I respect in the industry advocates. And it won't like make for a better workplace. It will make for better art. There's something that I say at the end of the lost chapter that I really believe could be a, I, I think I kind of don't use the exact same word formulation, but I do s repeat a similar sentiment. This was not the workings of the disembodied hand of fate. And I think that that's something that I encounter a lot in Hollywood and TV and film and the American industry that I cover. The idea that something couldn't be helped, that it had to be this way. Well, no. Something that couldn't be helped is if it starts raining and I stand outside without an umbrella, I will get wet. Those are natural consequences that will occur. You know, there were more than a hundred episodes of Lost and the people that I talked to worked there all six seasons. So again, not the disembodied hand of fate. This was people who had power to make other choices, consistently making a series of choices that resulted in what you read about. And, you know, not everyone had that experience at Lost. If there are people, and I think there may be people, I've, I'm guessing there are people who, you know, had a, had a generally great time and don't, don't have those complaints like the ones that I, or those um, histories like the ones that I brought up in the book. That's, that's fine. But this was significant enough to me, the things that I heard, that it, it needed to be talked about. And again, speaking of my career in general, especially the last few years, I don't like it when people frame things as situations they absolutely had to be passive about and could not have changed. I, I don't think that's accurate. There are situations when, yeah, you know, if you're an assistant or you're, you know, a low level crew member or, you know, there are a lot of people in their workplaces who cannot change the basic dynamics of it. People who worked for Scott Rudin, if you're an assistant or an intern, you did not have power over that workplace. Yes, I do accept that. When people who do have power used that power or allowed it to be used in ways that was negative, that's a choice. And I hope more people own that going forward. And however they are going to own it publicly or privately, what they do to change the industry will be the real indicator. Well, speaking of people who actually try to use their power to do something good, you have quite a few people in here who could be classified as heroes, people who really put their jobs on the line because they put their names out there. Yeah. It's a long list of them, but I I'm going to tell you my favorite. Is Orlando Jones one of the most stand-up people in Hollywood? Because after this, I feel like he is. I couldn't agree more. You know, he he's just a lot of fun to talk to. And, you know, he's just really smart. He's seen so much. And he's just got a historical perspective that is absolutely invaluable. It was invaluable for me and for the book. He's been around since the 90s. He's been an actor, a producer, a writer, a stand-up. He goes to fan conventions. So, like, there's no part of the industry he hasn't seen, been around, film, TV, all the rest of it. He just he, he just knows everything and everyone. So, what really impresses me in this industry is when people do have skin in the game and use it 
to create a better industry for all people coming up after them and with them, you know. And I, no doubt, Orlando was an incredibly wonderful source for me. And he's in a number of chapters. And the Sleepy Hollow stuff was just, you know, it was mind melting. And I, you know, it's, I almost did that chapter as much for me as for everybody else because I just, you know, I think we were talking a bit earlier, maybe before we were recording, but about things in the industry that melt your brain or that you can't ever understand, you never will understand. I mean, just from, if, if you just want to view it from a commercial money-making standpoint, Sleepy Hollow is one of those shows like Supernatural that could still be going now. Oh, it started so good. I loved it so much. It was so fun, that first season. It was so fun. It still hurts. It's still... Well, what I love about Orlando Jones, and he's always done this, because whenever I've seen his name, like you said, he's... He's so smart and so intelligent about how everything works, right? He's done it all. But he's also one of those guys, like, he's not saying, like, I have all the answers. He'll even say, they wanted me to do this, and that's what they wrote. So I did it. Like, that's my job. Mm -hmm. And it's like your book. He's realistic and reasonable, right? Like, if he sees something that's messed up, he's going to call it out. He'll put his name to it, which, I mean, how many people in Hollywood would not put their name to it? because of what would happen, but he'll say, I'll put that out there, but at the same time say, hey, this is also, this thing over here, I didn't agree with it, but, you know, there's nothing bad about it, so I just, I did what I was hired to do. It's hard to find somebody who is looking so clear-eyed at everything and be able to say that, hey, this is not my job, I don't need to fix everyone's everything, but if I'm going to see something bad, I'm going to call it out and I'll put my name to it. Right. And he's willing to state very clearly, like, well, you know, this was not the compensation that I required. And, you know, this was this happened and that happened and the other thing happened. And that is all. It's wonderful. That's the, the best part of writing the book was and is connecting with the people who enormously added to it. And, and you know, an, an interesting thing about sourcing is that, look, anyone who works with myself or another reporter and doesn't want to use their name in this particular industry I completely get it. I never judge it. I never, and I tell people that flat out, like, look, you, you know, you do what's right for you. And if we talk the first time, that's going to be off the record. I'll explain what I'm doing, where I think I'm going. But of course, I'm not locked in because I have to be open to the information that I get, what I would need from them, how they might proceed, how I work. And, you know, some people say, you know what, it's not right for me. Um, and I think they think I'm going to be mad. I'm not mad. First of all, you're negotiating an industry that is brutal on a, on its best day. <laughs> it's, it's not easy. So do you, I wish you well. And, uh, you know, if something changes down the road, just let me know. But if I can be a resource for you, I'll do that. Cause that's something that I find myself doing a lot is, is educating people about, you know, how does responsible journalism work? What would be required? What would I need? And I'm very upfront with people. I try to be, you know, without telling them things I can't, shouldn't tell them for ethical reasons. I try to be transparent about what I'm doing, what I know. Um, and as you, as you can see, even in, you know, contentious interviews, I try to be open. I mean, because Orlando, when he puts these things out there and puts his name to it, like he knows their jobs, he's not even get called for mm -hmm. because people are going to be like, I don't want to deal with it. Like he he's putting his money where his mouth is. A lot, yeah. And I, it's it's heartening when people do that. And I think there are a lot of people who've done that. And actually, if I'm honest with you, it's surprising to me over the years how many people have um, used their names. So, and again, no shade to the people who don't feel they can, because it's an incredibly risky industry. And as we've been talking about, it's getting harder and harder to sustain a career. So if people don't feel that's right for them, but the people who are willing to take a chance and do a properly vetted, fact-checked, you know, lawyered, edited story for a reputable publication, if they're willing to do that and use their name and use what standing they have in the industry to help other people, you know, for, for what I do on the day to day, that's way up there in terms of her heroics. Absolutely. Now, that's the first two thirds. What crystallized it for me, and it's not something that I really thought about, but especially the way Orlando Jones kind of sets up a conversation. And I'm going to pick on him because I think he's ridiculous. Jared Leto, right? There's a story about him in the movie mm -hmm. Morbius where when he's playing that he's extremely sick because he's a, I'm going to air quote, method actor. Like he would 
take his time going to the bathroom. Assistants would have to help him, even though the cameras were not running. And that's what really kind of brought everything together for me, because you forget that there's probably two assistants that had to help him walk when he could walk, and that everybody was there an hour longer because he has to have his method acting. And I know this didn't happen, but I just pictured in my head Orlando Jones standing next to Jared Leto and saying, could you cut this crap right now? Like you're wasting everyone's time. This is ridiculous. I know it didn't happen, but I'm just, it happened in my head. No, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of situations where no one has the juice to say that. And uh, even the director, perhaps. I'm not, and I'm not speaking specifically of that film. I just know of many situations in which someone who you think might be powerful in that situation, no one can say anything or no one feels they can say anything. That's the whole thing, isn't it? I understand that to be creative, to some degree, it sometimes is to be vulnerable. And if you're putting yourself out there as a writer or an actor or a director, you don't want to feel like you're going to necessarily be attacked. But this whole idea that one person's idea of creativity is allowed to negatively affect or even mess with other people, it's not, that's not, that's not creativity, you know, like, oh, that's just how I get, you know, loosened up for a scene or this or that. It's like, hmm. So on a set, there are hundreds of people. I personally am of the opinion that all of those people are human beings. <laughs> you know, they, they deserve to be treated with humanity and dignity. You know, I just, I think I understand person A, that's their creative process. But, you know, person C through D through Z, they're all people too. And if your brand of creativity means that we only shot one page that day and now we're eight days behind and I haven't seen my family in two weeks, I mean, come on, that's one person's method or uh, even at times, just speaking generally, monstrousness, that shouldn't be allowed to run roughshod over other people and ruin their daytime, their work days, and even to some degree, their, their personal life. And now your part two, you come up with very specific things that should change. Now, what I want to say here, and it's super important, is the first thing that you say Right. And this is kind of throughout the book, not just necessarily right there, is people screw up. And that doesn't mean you should automatically be fired. Right. Like people make mistakes. People are not going to have their best day. Mm -hmm. And as long as it's not something pervasive. Right. Say maybe you're on a show like the Goldbergs and, you know, you're just constantly harassing people for years on end. You should probably be fired. And I think a lot of people who want to take one very extreme side of this would be like, well, everyone's just going to get fired because they said something wrong someday. That's something that you take on right away and say, no, 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 just talk it out first. Right. See where you're coming from. Recognize that you made a mistake and just don't do it again. Not everybody needs to be fired for the first transgression. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think there is a spectrum of behaviors and actions and patterns. What I know I haven't ever done is weaponize a person's worst day. You had a worst day. I've had a worst day. Everyone has a really terrible, bad, bad day. We're human beings. We, we, we endeavor not to have the kind of bad day that n- very negatively affects other people. We are all striving for that. I do believe, or most of us are. So there is a spectrum of behaviors. And what makes me angry is that the people responsible for giving leaders or people in any authority position of any kind training, support, and supervision, the kind of training, support, and supervision they need to be good leaders, good co-workers, good collaborators, the biggest companies in the game, just generally speaking, do not do that kind of training. You know, the Writers Guild offers a showrunner training course. It's always, always more people that want to take the course than our spots available. I believe Sony now offers a a showrunner's course. A lot of people I know do formal or informal mentoring. Like a lot of people are trying to close this gap and pass on their skills. But in the same 10 years that we've been talking about, honestly, since like the beginning of streamers and, you know, Netflix and Amazon and the, the changing of the game that we're all now witnessing, those career mentorship pathways where you learn from going to set, you learn from watching your boss, you know, oversee, tw- you know, 22 episodes of TV a year. That has almost completely gone away. So in an industry in which people were already not being trained, given the support and resources they needed to be good leaders, there's even less of that now. There's more being piled on fewer people's plates, which again, if you haven't given people 
a very defined sense of what the parameters are for their behavior and giving them support and education so they can be good leaders, things are going to go awry, understandably. So, so all these tools, all this training, all the support, all this mentorship, all of this learning how to become a good leader, whether it's the head of the camera department or the head of the costume department or the head of the show or the head of, you know, the director of the film. Individuals in some groups are trying to make up for the lack of training and supervision that, frankly, the studios are simply not providing in the amount that they need to be providing it. So I don't necessarily think that all of the negative things that occur in the industry are the result of intent or a desire to be cruel or toxic or petty or any number of things. I think a lot of it is people absorbed the idea of what creativity looks like in it, you know, as I lay out in the book, that idea of what creativity is, is just very skewed and very wrong in some cases and absolutely harmful in some cases. But at the same time, while we're talking about this sort of spectrum of behavior, which I do believe it is a spectrum and you should deal with a five-year-old having a tantrum on the floor of a department store is not a studio executive screaming at their assistant in full view of everyone and, and just making them feel like absolutely terrible and humiliating them publicly. Those are different things. Those are, those are <laughs> unfortunate things. But you don't treat the five-year-old the same way as you treat, like that. Those are different levels of responsibility. I do think one thing that I, I talk about in the book that we have to sort of talk about more publicly is that there are people who, for whatever reason, and I'm not their shrinks, I'm not their bartenders, I'm not their moms, for whatever reason, some people damage other people because they can. They're allowed to, and they're, they can, and they want to, and so they do. In Hollywood, the problem that we run into again and again is that this is coded as passion, creativity, thrive, artistic persona. And look, I'm, I know tons of artistic people, you know, people who are artistic and creative in any number of realms. You can commit fully to your art without genuinely damaging other people around you in any, any number of ways as a, as a pervasive pattern of your behavior. It's absolutely impossible to do that. And I've now been covering the industry so long that I, I know people who are just incredible artists who would never dream of treating other people that way. And when given power over other people, they don't use their power that way. And it does not impede their ability to access their creative engines and tell the stories they want to tell. And that's the side of it that I think everybody thinks about when we talk about this. But you also hit the other side of this, which is everybody could just be under a lot of stress and just screwing it up. Like going back to, I mean, you're saying that people should be trained for their job. Perhaps you're the monster. But the way you talk about, right, a CEO, and I'm just going to say, like, we'll just use it. The CEO of Hulu needs to make money. That's how the business kind of keeps working, which means they're going to put stress on their showrunners. And some of these showrunners may have oh, this lady quit, so now this guy is getting put in there, but he's not trained, but we got to get this going. And it's just a very stressful environment because of these deadlines and everything like that. And it's bad and you shouldn't do it, but you start to say, hey, this is a good person who's under so much stress. He did yell at an assistant today. Yeah. And that's bad and we should fix that, but we're all human. And like you said, there's there's bad days. And as long as those aren't everyday bad days where you're just kind of a jerk, trying to figure out how we can kind of fix the system, which you talk about in here, mm -hmm. could take a lot of those bad days away. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, believe it or not, the IP chapter is one that I think gets into a lot of these issues because nowadays it's like, take this piece of intellectual property and we're going to do this spinoff TV show. We'll maybe give you some writers in a mini room and for two weeks or four weeks or six weeks and maybe, but then we're going to go into production. And if we keep you around, you're the only person in charge of everything now. It used to be if you had a 22 episode season of television, the writer's room begins, everyone starts cranking out scripts, they begin filming scripts. So there was a ton of pressure and still is for some of these shows that have these kind of episodic orders you know, at some point you are prepping the new episodes that are coming, sketching out the ones where you're just, you know, very much roughing out what episode 18 might be, but maybe you're filming episode 12 and you're prepping episode 13, getting the stories ready, the scripts ready, filming scripts, and then in post finishing the episodes. It's a lot, but there were 
people at a senior level who you could share the load and, and it was a training ground. You could learn how to solve problems as you watched your boss in the edit bay or on set. Now it's like, okay, for this eight episode uh, piece of IP spinoff that, you know, now that we're in production, if if we've kept you around, or maybe we just bring on somebody as on a weekly basis to punch up scripts. The other alternative is a lot of the time it's one person having to do all of it and they have no others. There's nobody else. There's no one to help them. That's not helping with stress. That's not helping with sharing the loads so that people can have sane work days and sane work environments. And already we were dealing with an industry where, again, like a 14 hour day is not that unusual. What other industry can you say that about? Like you, like an 18 hour, like there are some shows where you're like, oh yeah, that first season was brutal or that, you know, a film where like, okay, well, we were filming up at the Canadian Rockies for 16 hours a day. You know, that's, that is just, it's not great. It's, it's already a brutal industry. There need to be allowances made for the fact that human beings need to eat. They need to sleep. They need to have recharging time. What's kind of disheartening about the last few years is that even the people who have risen to those senior levels, they're actually seeing more pressure applied to them. And again, I do think that many people in the industry want a better industry, but the industry keeps thinking of new ways to kind of ratchet up that pressure on them, on the people that have stuck it out. And right now we're sitting looking at the pictures online or at the news reports about the results of ratcheting up that pressure endlessly. There's a strike. You know, people do reach a breaking point. You know, the, I think one of the things that woke a lot of people up last year was when IATSE, which is a guild for many different kinds of crew members, 98% of the guild voted on yes on a strike authorization. And then the strike didn't happen. They were able to hammer out a deal. But crews have not substantially struck in de- in decades. But we are we are heading down that road again, I think. If all of these labor actions or possible strikes or strikes work out this year and they're able to hammer out deals, I, I don't think that strikes are off the table because I think a lot of these things are very deep-seated issues and will take time to work out. Now, this is the part in the book where I said to myself, Mo has lost her mind. <laughs> The only one? This one. It's just this one. Nobody okay, else does right. this. You, you lost it. You got these. Like I said, these are all reasonable and realistic. I don't think anyone will look at this and say, oh, no, we can't do that. But you actually go a step further and you say it multiple times. You admit these things are going to be hard. A lot of people don't want to do that nowadays. And there is that middle ground that I love so much about this book. And it permeates the whole thing, which is we need to change this. This is what we need to do. But you're under no illusion that this stuff is easy and that it will take a lot and you go through concrete steps that you can take. But even you point out, like, this is not a tomorrow answer. This is not even a three or five year answer. And people in power could 100% take all of your ideas, but it's not easy. And there needs to be some, you know, realism about what can be done and what can be done when. Absolutely. You know, I think honestly, as, as people in the book say, I do think that this, this can be the attitude that I've read in the industry as well. The idea that people are disposable and if we break this set, we'll just get more. Okay. Like you, you can have that attitude, but you know, <laughs> you are going to sow what you reap. You know, that the entertainment won't be as good. You won't get as many subscribers. Maybe the executives don't care because they've already taken their giant paydays and you know, gone off and on their mega yacht into the su- sunset. It's it's not easy, but at the same time, these things are doable. It is doable to give an assistant a living wage. And a living wage for Los Angeles, I will fully admit, for someone who's living in central Arkansas, what they need to have, a, you know, a decent life is going to be different from someone whose job is in one of the most expensive cities in the world. And they can't live like two hours away from it because they're already working 12 hours a day. And then that means you don't ever sleep. So, you know, realistic pay for reasonable working conditions, treating people with empathy and dignity and reining in the people who are causing you the most problems, those things are eminently doable. You know, one thing I think about a lot, you know, as much as I agree with you, it it takes a lot of people working together and making a lot of big and little decisions over time. A lot of these decisions are not made in the public eye. It's not glamorous to do this grinding work every day. It's not glamorous to push back every time. But I think when people come together as groups, as the Writers Guild has done, that can affect change. And I also think about the fact that when I do the stories that I do, 
the only reason they are possible is because there is strength in numbers. The stories that I have done, I have I had anywhere from 16 to, or ch- chapters in this book, you know, 16 sources or 19 sources or 30 sources or 40 sources. I think that when you look at the work that I've put out and many of the reporters, you know, high profile reporters that have done this kind of work and some <laughs> reporters who should get more glory and more profile and more awards for the work they do. This is really difficult work and there's a lot of really wonderful people who do it. But if you look at what has been accomplished just since, say, I don't know, 2017, Harvey Weinstein's in jail. Bill Cosby is out of jail, but we all are very well informed about what his record was and what the acts that he did commit. Les Moonves is out at CBS. Like if, if you, if you looked at the entertainment landscape, you know, 10 years ago and we went down the roster of, you know, Matt Lauer is gone from NBC. There's an enormous array of people that 10 years ago looked untouchable who are now not in high level perches in the industry. Change can happen. If you had told me in 2015, even, you know, this is the array of people who will not have meaningful power in the industry in 2023, I would have been like, that will never happen. I do think that some of the change comes from the fact that these companies now realize that there is a reputational cost. And there's also just a a monetary cost. You know, several entities, including CBS, had to pay $30 million to the New York Attorney General's office as part of a series of settlements regarding the company's actions in the wake of the Me Too movement. I think a lot of creative people wish that that money would go toward the making of more shows that they could get employment on. You know, that's what I want, too. Or make the shows that come out better. I just... Right. Ooh, there's a lot of middling stuff. Yeah. Right. You've been around Hollywood this long. You have a great plan, honestly. What do you think is either out of willingness or out of resources or time? What's the hardest suggestion that you have to implement? That is a really good question. I think that large segments of the industry, large groups of powerful companies and powerful people at powerful companies are not willing to admit that some people are unwilling to change. And when they tell you that they have changed and will no longer be abusive, toxic, biased, or deeply damaging in some way, that they are not being truthful. Limits have to be set. I think the industry needs a much more robust set of guardrails. And part of the guardrails need to be, yes, offer training, support, supervision, help to the people that need help. Take some of the pressure off of them. Give them the resources and time that they need to do their jobs well and set limits on how they behave so that everyone understands you can't go beyond these limits. I personally cannot read another piece where a really rich person is quoted saying about another really rich person in the industry, well, where's the compassion for a person who engaged in a long time pattern of toxic behavior? (laughs) I interviewed a rabbi about compassion for my book. I think compassion is really important. You know, I want to pray to God. I like, I went to Catholic school. I invoked the memory of the nuns, you know, that taught me. I do get that, but I do think a lot of people at the top, for whatever reason, a lot of these big companies are willing to turn a blind eye to those who are unwilling to change their damaging longstanding patterns. Some people won't change. If we are to take up the idea that evolution, change, significant positive alteration is possible, which I do believe, I believe it absolutely. I've seen some things and I've seen some people in the industry change. I believe that wholeheartedly. But as a reporter, my motto is trust but verify. Trust without verification is useless. Compassion without boundaries is a form of enabling. That's a quote from somebody that I quote in the book. And I I absolutely believe that. And also at some point, you just got to say, okay, well, maybe other companies or other entities or other production companies or producers are going to work with that person. For me, it's a no. It's a hard no. I'm not going to work with them. I think a lot about what people like Scott Rudin wrought. What if more people years ago had said, I'm not going to work with him because he treats people abusively. I understand that people want to make their films and that a lot of people thought, well, he's the only one that can get my, my project over the line and get a green light. You know, the number of people who are out there who were permanently scarred and given mental health problems by what they went through is not small. At some point, as a person, as a company, as an entity, you have to say some people are cut off. And that's just that. 
they've had opportunities to change. You know, you have to be willing to meaningfully review whether they took those opportunities to meaningfully vet that. But talking to Bo Travis, Dr. Bo Travis, the another expert in my book, this is a man who works with people convicted of sexual crimes. His whole job is to assess whether the in-depth long-term treatment that they got to change their behavior worked. That's his whole job. And again, these are people convicted of crimes who get sent to state prison. If he says this is a long, arduous process that needs to be overseen by a number of expert professionals, then that's what I believe. I think that that's true. If you're going to do this work of changing significantly abusive, toxic, or even criminal behavior, that's a big commitment of time, energy, money, resources, and everything else. I think a lot of entities in this industry are just like, well, he said he saw a new shrink and, you know, so it's it's fine now. Is it? Oh, cool. So who who's your source on it's fine now? It's him, the guy who actually did the stuff <laughs> or his agent who wants to get him work because the agent doesn't get a commission if that person doesn't get work. Oh, cool. That seems credible. You know, those are choices. Those are not inevitabilities. Well, we had to hire this person for our movie. Did you? There are no other skilled actors who could have done that. There are just so many, so many, so many good creative people out there. Did you have to hire that one? Why did you hire that one? What proof do you have that this person who did this array of things and it's been proven and it's factual and this might only be the tip of the iceberg, what proof do you have that they are now changed? Well... Um, he went uh, to this anger management place that is like a resort in Malibu. Oh, cool. Uh-huh. And? Well, I mean, Mo, the very simple answer here is, well, let's just put this to bed. They should hire Orlando Jones. You can't go I wrong. I think so. Put I him think right so. in there. Now, Burn It Down is fantastic, Mo. I love it. It, it. There's a little bit of history, right? You know, just these are shows that have happened. They're in the past. But, you know, there's a lot of, it, we would say nonfiction, right? But at History Nerd United, we know that there are people up there who say, I don't read nonfiction. Nonfiction is boring. Now, we can't fix those people, but if I sat one of them down in front of you and they said, why should I read Burn It Down, what would you say? This is not history. This is stuff that's happening right now in some cases. And if you ever wanted to read about what goes on behind the scenes in Hollywood and have your jaw on the floor at the same time, (laughs) this, this might be the book for you. If you watch TV and movies and you care about how that stuff is made and and you think today what needs to be changed about these entities, then read my book. (laughs) Mo, thank you so much for coming on. Of course. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for this episode. Head out, nerds, buy, burn it down. Mo, thank you so much for coming on. Hit us up on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Listen to other episodes of the podcast. Tell your friends about them. Don't forget to subscribe and rate us five stars, please. We'd really appreciate it. Until next time, nerds, stay cool.